Does it amaze you that from small building blocks where um, amino acids, you mentioned molecules, let's go to the very beginning of hydrogen and helium at the start of this universe. <laughs> they were able to build up such um, complex and beautiful things like our human brain. So studying thermodynamics, which is exactly the question of, you know, ba batteries run out and need recharging. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, equipment, you know, cars get old and fail, mm -hmm. yet life doesn't. And it, th that's why there's a, a sense in which life seems to violate thermodynamics, although of course it doesn't. It seems to resist the march towards entropy somehow. Right, and so Maxwell, who helped give rise to the science of thermodynamics, uh, posited a, a, a problem that was so infuriating it led to a series of suicides. There was a series of uh, um, advisors and advisees, um, three in a row that all ended up committing suicide that happened to work on this problem. And uh, Maxwell's demon is this simple but infamous problem where Right now in this room, we're surrounded by molecules and they run at different velocities. Um, imagine a container that has a wall and it's got gas on both sides and a little door. And if the door is a molecular sized creature and it could watch the molecules coming and when a fast molecule is coming, it opens the door. When a slow molecule is coming, it closes the door. Mm -hmm. After it does that for a while, one side is hot, one is cold. When something is hot and is cold, you can make an engine. And so you close that and you make an engine and you make energy. Mm -hmm. So the demon is violating thermodynamics because it's, it's, not, it's never touching the molecule, yet by just opening and closing the door, it can make arbitrary amounts of energy and power a machine. Mm -hmm. And in thermodynamics, you can't do that. So that's Maxwell's demon. Uh, that problem is connected to everything we just spoke about for the last few hours. Mm -hmm. So uh, Leo Szilard uh, around um, early 1900s was a deep physicist who then had a lot to do with um, also uh, po post-war anti-nuclear things, but he reduced... Maxwell's demon to a single molecule. So the molecule, one, there's only one molecule, and the question is which side of the partition is it on? Mm -hmm. That led to the idea of one bit of information. So Shannon credited Zillard's analysis of Maxwell's demon for the invention of the bit. Mm -hmm. um, for many years, people tried to explain Maxwell's demon by like the energy in the demon looking at the molecule or the energy to open and close the door, and nothing ever made sense. Um, finally, Rolf Landauer, one of the colleagues I mentioned at IBM, finally solved the problem. He showed that you can explain Maxwell's demon by you need the mind of the demon. Mm -hmm. um, when the demon open and closes the door, as long as it remembers what it did, you can run the whole thing backwards. Mm -hmm. But when the demon forgets, then you can't run it backwards. And that's where you get dissipation. And that's where you get the uh, violation of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. And so the explanation of Maxwell's demon is that it's, it's in the demon's brain. Mm -hmm. So then <laughs> Rolf's colleague, colleague Charlie at IBM uh, then shocked Rolf by showing you can compute with arbitrarily low energy. <laughs> so one of the things that's not well covered is the, the big computers used for big machine learning, the data centers use tens of megawatts of power. They use as much power as a city. Um, Charlie showed you can actually compute with arbitrarily low amounts of energy by making computers that can go backwards as well as forwards. <laughs> And what limits the speed of the computer is 
how fast you want an answer and how certain you want the answer to be. But we're orders of magnitude away from that. So I have a student, Cameron, working with Lincoln Labs on making superconducting computers that operate near this Landauer limit, limit that are orders of magnitude more efficient. Um, so stepping back to all of that, that whole tour was driven by your question about life. And uh, you know, right at the heart of it is Maxwell's demon. L life exists because it can locally violate thermodynamics. It can locally violate thermodynamics because of intelligence, and it's it's molecular intelligence that you know. I would even go out on a limb to say we can already see we're beginning to come to the end of this current AI phase. So, depending on how you count, this is I'd say the fifth AI boom bust cycle, mm -hmm. and you can already you know it, it's exploding, but you can already see where it's heading you know, how it's going to saturate what, what happens on the far side. Um, the big thing that's not yet on horizons is, is embodied AI, AI, molecular intelligence. So to step back to this AI story, um, th th there was automation and that was going to change everything. Then there were expert systems um, uh, it, it, there was then the you know the first phase of the neural network systems. There have been about five of these. Mm -hmm. um, in each case, on the slope up, it's going to change everything. Um, in each case, what happens is on the slope down, um, we sort of move the goalposts and it becomes sort of irrelevant. So a good example is uh, going up, computer chess was going to change everything. Once computers could play chess, that fundamentally changes the world. Now on the downside, computers play chess. Winning at chess is no longer seen as a unique human thing, mm -hmm. but um, uh, people still play chess. You know, this new phase is going to take a new chunk of things that we thought computers couldn't do. Now computers will be able to do. They have roughly our brain capacity. Um, but you know, we'll keep thinking as well as computers. Um, and as I described, while we've been going through these five boom busts, if you just look at the numbers of ops per second, bits storage, bits of IO, that's the more interesting one. That's been steady and that's what finally caught up to people. Mm -hmm. But you know, as we've talked about a couple of times, there's eight orders of magnitude to go, not in the intelligence in the transistors or in the brain, but in the embodied intelligence, in the intelligence in our body. So the intelligent constructions of physical systems that would embody the intelligence versus contain it within the computation. Right, and th th there's a brain centrism that assumes our intelligence is centered in our brain. <laughs> and in endless ways in this conversation, we've been talking about molecular intelligence. Our molecular systems do a deep kind of artificial intelligence. All the things you think of as artificial intelligence does in representing knowledge, storing knowledge, surf searching over knowledge, adapting to knowledge, our molecular systems do. But the output isn't just a thought, it's it's us. It's the evolution of us. And that's, you know, the real horizon to come is now embodying AI of not not just a processor and a robot, but but you know, <laughs> building systems that really can grow and evolve.